Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Micronutrients, the hotly anticipated sequel to Macronutrients. All right, it, it's not that highly anticipated, I admit, but here we are. Remember here, uh, review that micronutrients are anything crucial to bodily function, but they're needed in small amounts as the vitamins and minerals. And I bet you got the drill by now. The elderly are at a higher risk for micronutrient deficiency than average adults. So why? A lot of the same reasons, as we've already discussed, socioeconomic factors, morphological factors, poor diet, and a lot of times age will be listed along with other factors. Kind of again, because we're not sure to what degree just being older plays a part in the risks involved. So this one specifically, there are a few things to mention here. We are discussing B vitamins in this this module or this lecture specifically. Um, it's important to remember that all micronutrients have multiple jobs in maintaining health. Not the body doesn't just use a vitamin for one thing. They do multiple things. Remember that this whole lecture is going to discuss just the ones that are of primary issue interest in geriatrics. All of them are important, but man, we do not have time to go over all of them individually. So we're grouping B vitamins today. It's especially important to remember that B vitamins have a very, very similar functions to each other. So much so that you may, if you've ever wondered why B vitamins are numbered the way they are, and we have strange numbers and holes, uh, it's because that B vitamins are so similar in both function and form that we've had more than that in the past. We more than that. We up to 20, I believe. And uh, the research would be going on. We think, aha, discovered a new B vitamin. And then more time would go on and, and people would say, oh, no, this is not a new compound. This is just a new form of another vitamin. So B vitamins have many similar functions and their signs and symptoms of deficiency are infuriatingly similar as well until you get very, very deficient. And I'm also in no way going to apologize for this pun, this God tier pun that works on multiple levels. It's staying up there. Also, uh, it's worth noting that most of the time in gerontology, I do not see specific vitamins being noted as deficient. I've not run across hypothiaminemia, hyponiacinemia. It's typically just referred to as a B vitamin deficiency. And they're often treated in groups. The assumption being that if you're short of one, you're short of more than one because the sources of B vitamins are very, very similar. Now, there is an exception to that. That's B12. B12 does have its own diagnosis. All right, so let's do about... Uh, a few of them. Now, I know I said there aren't a lot of them that are diagnosed. Occasionally, thiamine is diagnosed as a deficiency in and of itself. Remember that the uh, severe deficiency is beriberi, which translates uh, into I can't. Uh, also, Wernicke-Korsakoff progresses more. Uh, the deficiency presents as weight loss, emotional disturbances, weakness or neuropathy in the limbs, and intermittent arrhythmia. Now, thiamine is infamous for being related to alcohol abuse, and that is certainly a cause of it. And it may that this may also factor in with age because there is some evidence that the elderly are more at risk of alcohol abuse than the general, you know, than younger adults. That's not for certain, but it has been some of the literature does point that way. But it can also be related to poor intake. And it seems like age might pay, play a role all by itself, regardless of other intake. Uh, Mickelson estimates that about 20% of elderly patients are deficient in thiamine, which is much, much higher than the general adult population. So what are the sources? Um, note here on sources before we get further. Uh, just like everybody else, all the all their dietitians, Gerontologists will tell you that uh, food is where it's at. That's the goal uh, to supplement, to provide all nutrients through food. But 
Uh, let me also say that supplementation is where it's at when you have somebody who has a deficiency. When you have an elder with a deficiency, the best course of action is often to supplement immediately and once the, the acute deficiency has resolved, then support through food. The, the outcomes are very clear that long-term food is a better source, but short-term for an acute intervention, uh, supplementation works great. So just keep that in mind. So for, sub, for beriberi, uh, the supplementation recommendations are 50 milligrams intramuscularly daily until there are no more symptoms and then maintaining 2.5 milligrams PO. Uh, some people have suggested that the elderly intake of thiamine should be calculated at 1.5 milligrams per day versus 1.2, or at least the recommended intake should be, for the same reasons as protein intake and fluid intake. Not because thiamine has some sort of magical qualities to it that will prophylactically help in some way, because we're anticipating uh, a deficiency, and so we're going to pump up the numbers to help with that, to help counteract that expected deficiency. Okay, vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 deficiency is very, very rare. Uh, you will see it in children and the elderly, and I have seen it in practice. It presents as constipation, nausea, weakness, and fatigue, and I've, hopefully you're seeing now how I'm talking about about how all of these short these um, deficiency symptoms are just maddeningly similar. The infamous deficiency uh, sign symptom is uh, burning feet syndrome. It's also called Grierson Goppelin, but everybody I have ever heard calls it burning feet syndrome because that's way more catchy. Now, I have seen this myself in practice. The person who had it described the burning feet sensation as more like the pins and needles that you get when something has, like your foot's gone to sleep and it's waking back up. That's how they described it. All right, B6 sources are, uh, if mammal sources are organ meats and fatty fish. Uh, plant sources are chickpeas, potatoes, bananas, dark leafy greens. Uh, supplementation, there is no B6 supplementation. Uh, I mean, you, it exists. I, you, can, you can go get it. I have not seen that happen, usually even for a clinically deficient individual. It's mostly just a B-complex PO per day. All right, B9 deficiencies or folate. Um, I know that most people are used to seeing folate as a, or they associate it with pregnancy, and that is very, very important, but it does present in elderly patients as well. Um, Signs and symptoms of this are fatigue, irritability, diarrhea. It can present as megaloblastic anemia. The sources are dark leafy greens and whole grains, again. And supplementation is 1,000 micrograms PO per day. And B12, which is, I would argue, the most common vitamin deficiency you see in, in the elderly, except maybe for uh, vitamin D. That's up in the air. Those two, though, definitely. B12 can also present as megaloblastic anemia. It can present with, as chelitis, glossitis with pain, weakness, and fatigue, constipation, and anorexia. Uh, neuro, it also has neurological signs and symptoms, which can be uh, depression, anxiety, poor memory, and dementia and confusion. It's important to note with B12 deficiency that physical symptoms will recede with supplementation. However, it's possible that the neurological damage that presents may be permanent. Also, will not surprise you at this point in the course, I'm sure, to learn that there's evidence that the signs and symptoms and diagnostic levels for B, vit B, vit no, B12 deficiency may be different in the elderly versus the general population. So, why is the nerve damage permanent? Uh, B12 is a necessary component in creating the myelin sheath on axons. Uh, without B12, the myelin sheath will deteriorate over time. And I have, uh, oh, there we go, I was got to re-coordinate with the camera. This is an example of demyelination in MS, but it's the same, uh, it's the same process. If you remember, uh, the myelin sheath is like an insulation along the axons of the nerves, and 
if that myelin sheath is disrupted, the message, the signals from the nerves can become uh, distorted or they travel more slowly or they don't make it at all. And that's the cause of both of these issues. Without B12, the myelin sheath can't repair, but once the supplementation has begun, the damage done to the myelin sheath will not repair. So that damage, damage may be permanent, and so the neurological symptoms may be permanent as well. Okay, very briefly, I want to discuss B12 digestion and absorption because uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, this is what we call nutter butters. So cast your mind back to when you, I'm sure you discussed it in undergrad. Remember, when you eat something with B12, the B12 binds to salivary haptocorin, which you may have heard described as R factor. The uh, haptocorin protects B12 from acid degradation. So once it lands in the stomach, the food it's attached to, the proteins that the B12 is attached to, will denature, and the B12 is removed, but the haptocorin keeps it bound and protected from the acid in the stomach. It's then shuttled over to the duodenum, where the haptocorin is cleaved, and the B12 binds to intrinsic factor. The B12 intrinsic factor travels through the small intestine to the terminal ileum, and it's absorbed by the cubulin receptors. So a couple fun facts here. Uh, about 56% uh, percent of the cobalamin eaten is absorbed this way. Uh, now, it is estimated that about 1% of that would happen without the haptocorin and the intrinsic factor. So yeah, that's much better. Uh, it's also important to note that this, the amount of B12 that can be absorbed decreases when the capacity of intrinsic factor is exceeded. It's a lot like transferrin. No matter how much iron you give somebody with that's depleted, if they don't have enough transferrin to move it, it's not going to get there. Uh, same thing with intrinsic factor. You can overload the body's ability to produce intrinsic factor with B12, and so you'll get diminishing returns if you supplement with too much, with a lot of B12 containing foods. Now, note that supplemental B12, like artificial B12, in either PO form or intramuscularly, does not need haptocorin or intrinsic factor. The body can absorb that and uh, process that separately. So that is a way around the intrinsic factor limit, and we'll get to why that's important in a minute. So what are the causes of deficiencies of B12? Uh, poor protein intake, whether this is poor quality protein, and I don't want, you know, B12 comes from animal sources, and I, I know there's more to it than that, but from a nutritional standpoint, it comes from animal sources. Um, so it can be that more, that this person is consuming more plant sources of B12, I'm sorry, more plant sources of protein than animal sources, or it may be that they're just struggling to get enough protein. This is also relates to uh, GI tract disorders, autoimmune disorders, age itself may be a factor, we don't know, and uh, atrophic gastritis. Remember earlier in the course uh, that over time, Atrophic gastritis may develop just in the elderly. Uh, what The issue there is that with atrophic gastritis, the stomach loses its ability to produce both hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. So it cannot denature the protein as easily that's eaten. And remember that intrinsic factor is the limiting factor for B12 in many circumstances. So the if there's less intrinsic factor, there's less B12 that can be moved. Uh, let's discuss anemias here because we know how to have fun. Megaloblastic anemia, uh, also called macrocytic anemia, is a reduction of mature, healthy erythrocytes. What you get instead are large or poorly formed erythrocytes who get fewer number, larger cells. And they either may fail to enter blood circulation or they may not be able to function as well as a healthy erythrocyte. This is most commonly related to both folate and cobalamin deficiencies. Also, uh, pernicious anemia. So the body can store about three years worth of B12. It's, it's the only water-soluble vitamin the body can store in a large amount. So uh, what causes this autoimmune disorder? Autoimmune disorder, let me try to say that clearly, that uh, can destroy the gastric mucosa. 
This also causes gastric atrophy. And the same issue again, it leads to achloridia and loss of production of intrinsic factor that keeps the B12 trapped in the food, leads to deficiency, and pernicious anemia can eventually progress to macrocytic anemia. Uh, keep in mind, pernicious means sneaky, deceitful, dangerous. So this is a creeping kind of anemia that builds up over time. Okay, very quickly, we're going to discuss the methylfolate trap. This is the last time we're going to have a bit, well, it's not the last time, sorry. It's the last time we'll have a, a, a graph like this, though. Okay, so methylfolate trap, if you're not familiar with this, is you ever had a situation at work where somebody else did not show up and you had extra work you had to do, couldn't get it all done, and you got blamed for the fact that the other person didn't show up? That's what the methylfolate trap is. This is folate taking a bum rap because B12 did not show up today. Now, it's important to note that these are all cycles. These are all happening all at the same time, and there are multiple different uh, there are multiple different ways to start tracking this these cycles. We're going to go from either end with the food. I usually go through from the B12 side with the methionine. So what we're going to do, our marker for this is going to be homocysteine. Uh, we'll come back to homocysteine in just a minute. The other important players in this are 5-methyltetrahydrofolate and tetrahydrofolate. Tetrahydrofolate is the biologically active form of folate. 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate is the form that folate is stored in in the body most. And our key conspirator here is the B12, specifically the methionine synthase enzyme. So what happens is we're coming in from the right side with food. You get the methionine. We're not going to track through all of this. But we come up to the fact that we have homocysteine through several changes and 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate. Without B12, methionine synthase does not happen. We need the methyl from the homocysteine to transfer over, or I'm sorry, we need the methyl from the 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate to be taken away by the homocysteine so that the tetrahydrofolate is active in the system. What we have, if we don't have enough B12, is a buildup of 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate and a buildup of homocysteine. And that is how the two, one of them, usually B12, can mask, or sorry, how a one deficiency in one can mask the other. Typically, this is a folate, defi, uh, folate masking a B12 deficiency. There we go. Let me say that again. It's a folate masking a B12 deficiency. But in theory, it could work the other way as well. All right, so what is homocysteine? Homocysteine is a cysteine homologue, as you saw in the previous uh, slide. It's synthesized from methionine. It's not obtained from the diet. It has to be synthesized from methionine, and it can recycle back into cysteine. It's higher in men. It uh, may be positively associated with age. We don't know. It seems to be inversely correlated to B vitamin intake. Okay, so homocysteine is um, causes endothelial damage. Most often where you may hear about homocysteine and concerns of it is in heart, cardiovascular diseases, specifically heart disease. A high level of homocysteine in the body can lead to atherosclerosis and vascular incidences. Incidences? Incidents. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, thrombosis. It may also lead to dementia. Maybe it, it appears to be positively correlated to dementia as well. Now, all of these are true. All of these things, cardiovascular disease, uh, heart attack, strokes, thrombosis, uh, are all positively associated with uh, hyperhomocysteemia. The mechanism behind this is not clear at this time. So here's, here's some more reading if you'd like to. I think this is the last slide of many words. Apologies, I don't like doing this. I just couldn't figure out a good way to fit it in. So what can we do about it? What interventions can we do? Uh, again, a PO B vitamin complex. You can do individual B vitamins, but I am along with every other, I, I'm not original. 
I go with a lot of the other gerontologists. If there's one B vitamin that appears to be deficient, I'm willing to bet there's more than one that's deficient. Now, B12, again, is kind of its own separate one. It's the only one that typically gets a diagnosis by itself. And it's important to remember that B12 can be given uh, intramuscularly as well as PO. I mean, you can't do that, but the doctor can, and it might be worth recommending if, if, if she needs a little nudge. Um, remember to provide and encourage enriched foods like cold cereal, enriched breads, rice, and pastas, and push the um, leafy greens as much as possible. Okay, so here we are. Elders are at higher risk than average for B vitamin deficiency. It's the socioeconomic factors, anatomical, morphological factors, and or the, and maybe age by itself. You know, at this point, we're not really sure. Where the by, uh, B vitamin deficiency can cause hematological, neurological, and energy use problems. And that is B vitamin deficiencies. I will catch you when we do next time. We're going to do C, D, and we're going to hit zinc and iron also. Have a great rest of the whatever part of the day it is for you. See you next time. Bye.